Hello, everyone, and thanks for watching this seminar. Uh, it's a part of Turkey Beyond Borders seminar series, uh, and I would like to thank Dr. Pınar Dinç for her invitation and all the others who are working behind the scenes, uh, translating, preparing uh, these videos. Uh, my name is Bilge Abanji. Uh, I'm a Marie Curie Fellow at Kaposkari University of Venice in Italy and Northwestern University in USA. And today um, I would like to talk about civil society under the pressure of autocratization. I've been researching on this topic um, roughly since 2017, first as a part of my postdoctoral project at Stockholm University, then also um, I continued here at the University of Venice. And it's also the topic of my current book project. Um, so I would particularly focus on the case of Turkey under the AKP rule because, um, because of its representative value for, uh, for multiple and complex transformations of civil society under uh, regime change um, and a gradual rise of an undemocratic regime. Uh, however, I would like to also mention upfront that this is uh, by no means an issue unique to Turkey. Um, quite contrarily, the dynamics of civil society's transformation, uh, particularly what I will be discussing, uh, repression, cooptation, and contestation dynamics, um, follow very similar patterns in countries undergoing uh, autocratization. So, um, what I would like to do in this seminar is um, first to set the theoretical and conceptual grounds in the first part. And towards this aim, we will look into two different bodies of literature. Uh, one is autocratization, democratic regression and regime change literature very briefly. And the other one is civil society theory or theories. Uh, building on this initial part, uh, in the second part, I would like to turn to our case of Turkey and share some of the findings of my research. And particularly in this part, I would like to reflect on what I call a, a three, four fold transformation of civil society under autocratic pressure. Uh, by this three fold triple transformation, I mean that civil society can be a gateway to both deepening and democratic rule uh, particularly by generating consent for undemocratic practices. And also it can be a gateway for contesting and resisting it. And we will look into these parallel dynamics, the intricate ways in which civil society can become a contested, polarized and politicized space under autocratization. But let's start with uh, settling the grounds. So what is autocratization and the related terms, democratic backsliding and democratic regression or democratic erosion? Uh, this could be a lecture of its, of its own. Um, and there is a large body of dynamic research on the topic, but we will just focus on the basics because I do not want to assume that everyone would be working on these concepts or with theories from political science. So um, democratic backsliding, um, and often scholars use democratic erosion, democratic decline, regression synonymously with some nuances. Um, it refers to the elimination of political institutions that sustain an existing democracy. In other words, it refers to conscious, intentional and systematic actions to erode and destroy representative participatory and pluralistic institutions and practices associated with democracy. So what are these institutions? What are these practices? This could be uh, free and fair elections, independent judiciary, free media, checks and balances, civil society. Um, Nancy Bermio talks about in a very influential essay, talks about six different ways that an existing democracy can be debilitated. The first method that democracy is undermined is the classic coup d'etat by militaries. The second is what she calls executive coups or self coups. Basically, the chief executive suspends the constitution and just decides to become one man ruler. The third option is obscene and deep electoral fraud 
to totally change the results of the elections, to block free voting, ballot stuffing, stealing ballots at large scale. And Bermia argues that these three paths to democratic backsliding are no more practiced widely. They have almost disappeared. Yet, the three other pathways are still in use. One of these pathways, the fourth pathway to democratic de decline, is what she calls promissory coup. So the promissory coups are very familiar to scholars who work on modern Turkey's history, actually. In these coups, uh, the coup makers avoid staying in power for an extended period of time and claim that their intervention is necessary and temporary just to restore order. And even they promise to bring a new and democratic order. And Bermia tells us that the number of promissory coups are on the rise compared to these open-ended classic coups uh, when the coup makers stayed in power for years and even decades. In many of the promissory coups since 1990s, Bermia gives us the data, uh, elections follow the few years after the coup, but of course, we should add that in almost none of them, uh, uh, this, the situation resulted in better or institutionalized democracies. The fifth path is what we are really interested in, the executive aggrandizement that paves the way for democratic backsliding indeed. Here, I'm quoting from Bermio to explain what is executive aggrandizement. So executive aggrandizement unfolds, quote, when elected executives um, weaken checks, and checks on executive power one by one, undertaking series of institutional changes that hamper the power of opposition forces to challenge executive uh, uh, preferences, end of quote. So Walder and Lust, in another influential article, uh, they also uh, define backsliding as, uh, quote, backsliding uh, entails a deterioration of qualities associated with democratic governance within any regime. It is a decline in the quality of democracy where it occurs within democratic regimes, or in democratic qualities of governance in autocracies, end of quote. So democratic backsliding takes place at a much slower pace compared to coups, promissory classic or self coups. The degradation of democratic institutions is undertaken through legal or extra legal channels. They are not blatantly or openly anti-constitutional. Hmm? And they usually happen through using gray zones, gaps in the legislation by building slowly consent for them so that the violations of democratic practices and institutions can be even voted and chosen by the electorate through referendums. Constitutional courts or legislatures may also be used to give it a legal uh, cover, especially when the executive, of course, gains the control of such bodies. And in short, the decline of democracy is slow and always claimed to be somehow in line with the legal procedures or popular legitimacy through voting. So of course, Turkey uh, in this case is a textbook example of executive aggrandizement under the AKP rule. And I'm not going to go into details, but it is very widely accepted in the literature. The parliament is monopolized and the opposition parties are sidelined during the parliamentary debates and voting procedures. Uh, then of course, AKP used its legislative power to impose legal changes in the court structure, uh, civil law, criminal law, electoral regulations, education, etc. Uh, higher courts were staffed, mm. media is controlled to manipulate information flow uh, to help generate consent, and we also have um, a heavy reliance of popular legitimacy through um, use of voting under stark partisan polarization in Turkey. Mm. So the final path to democratic backsliding, the sixth path, is um, deliberate and strategic manipulation of elections. And it often goes uh, uh, with executive aggrandizement path. Um, there are several ways of manipulating elections, uh, but they are different from obscene and open electoral fraud that we mentioned. 
These include manipulating and controlling the media and information channels, um, or using state finances to fund the ruling party's campaigns, manipulating, hampering voter registration, packing electoral commissions with loyal people to the executive, gerrymandering or uh, changing electoral districts in ways to favor uh, the incumbents. And all is done before the election day so that the elections themselves do not appear to be fraudulent up, up front, or the government, uh, the incumbents do not, uh, 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 do not need to actually stuff the ballots or steal votes. These two parts, executive aggrandizement and systematic electoral manipulation to democratic backsliding, uh, democratic erosion, have become the dominant means uh, of uh, 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 pretty much over the last two decades. Hmm? Scholars working on this issue, uh, and particularly the ones monitoring these changing these changes across different countries over a long period of time claim that um, democracy is facing a global scale backsliding now. Uh, and the quality and the quantity of democratic institutions, um, actors, procedures have deteriorated across the world continuously over the last two decades, pretty much. And for the first time, they claim since uh, 2001, the number of democratic countries is less than non-democracies. And in the vast majority of these cases, the current democratic backsliding is due to the gradual power abuse by the incumbents who were elected by free and fair voting. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps it's also important to mention that democratic backsliding is distinct from reversion of, of autocracy. So this um, gradual decline of liberal or electoral democracies gives rise to hybrid regimes or gray zone regimes, hmm? regimes that combine characteristics of democratic and authoritarian governance at different levels. I will not in get into the detail of several subtypes and classifications of such regimes that would be too much of a diversion from our major topic, but we should say that the degree of authoritarianism and the proportion of democratic practices to autocratic ones change um, from one hybrid regime to another, it's sufficient to say that many hybrid regimes uh, today are a byproduct of democratic decline, democratic backsliding in former democracies, uh, that they cannot be, to an extent that they cannot be anymore considered uh, an electoral democracy. Mm -hmm. So um, the discussion um, up until this point uh, briefly sum the notion of democratic backsliding for the ones who are not from political science. Um, and I hope it is clear that um, uh, there is an ongoing dynamic research on this topic. And this extensive democratic backsliding scholarship has focused on the formal institutional, uh, structural, historical, and incumbent driven reasons of, uh, of democratic decline, of autocratization. And they sought to classify different types of hybrid regimes. So of course these studies offer valuable insights, but what I argue in my research and in this seminar is that this vast literature on democratic uh, backsliding offers um, a limited and secondary treatment of the emergence of new intermediaries for generating social support for the authoritarian turn. So I would say that, to keep it short, there has been, first, a lack of original primary data in explaining why attacks against democratic constitutional systems that erode freedoms, participation, pluralism, etc., receive um, continuous support from society in many cases. And second, there has been a limited systematic analysis of the authoritarian institutional landscaping beyond the partisan arena, partisan institutions. So there has been a lot of research on the elections, legislative and executive bodies and the party system, but a lack of understanding and theorization of the capture co-optation of non-partisan institutions. So this lack of research and theorization on more subtle and more informal but lasting mechanisms of autocratization 
need to be addressed better in a systematic research. So to obtain a fuller understanding of democratic regression autocratization, I think we need to look deeper into the societal dimensions of nonpartisan mechanisms of de-democratization and also resistance to it. And one of these venues or spaces that democratic backsliding unfolds, disseminated, entrenched, but also resisted is civil society. But what is civil society? Um, it is one of the most used terms of political science or sociology. It's a buzzword, highly contested in political and social theory still. And we will look at the scholarly debates on that. So I think we can talk about uh, two main schools of thought regarding the civil society theory. So the first school of thought is the dominant or more known, let's say, uh, one, which is inspired by Tocqueville and Locke, and the liberal theory, the enlightenment idea that humans um, are capable of self-rule. Um, and this approach is particularly penetrated into democratization studies. And in this approach, civil society is defined as an autonomous sphere independent of state or politics on the one hand and the market on the other hand. So it's the third sector as, as, as it is widely referred. And this third sector of civil society uh, is to realize individual rights and freedoms free from the intrusions of the state. Many uh, scholars in fact define civil society as the voluntary independent um, self-regulatory organizations like associations, foundations, professional NGOs, trade unions, religious groups, social movements. And the liberal scholarship also associates civil society with democracy and pluralism, arguing that civil uh, society challenges undemocratic systems because it articulates democratic demands and mobilizes anti-authoritarian forces. And in democracies, of course, organized civil society acts as, um, as, as its checks uh, against potential abuses of power, um, keep political authorities um, accountable um, and, and voices societal demands. Mm -hmm. And civil society is also considered in this, uh, in this theory um, as a generator of social capital you know, cultivating engaged citizenry and a political culture supportive of democracy and, 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 and pluralism. Um, and of course, this approach uh, is specifically focused on the rights of association and assembly and on the civic rights in general, and emphasizes the cultural disposition to associate communal trust, reciprocity. Hmm? Slightly different approach, but I think it can be still within the liberal democratic tradition is the Habermasian approach to civil society as a tool uh, or venue to strengthen deliberation, deliberative sides of democracy. Hmm? Um, so it is not surprising, of course, uh, that civil society is so much associated with democracy and pluralism because civic activism played an enormous role in the democratic transitions in 1980s, 1990s in the Central and Eastern Europe, uh, first in Latin America. And almost naturally, civil society has become associated with individual and group freedoms and democratic demands. Um, and not surprisingly, of course, international donors invested large scale programs for civil society promotion in 1990s and 2000s. Um, but of course, civil society hype, if you like, has also coincided with the diffusion of neoliberalization and privatization, um, the rejection of the state in the neoliberal paradigm particularly emphasizes that the state should withdraw from social provision, should leave the stage for private actors. So the state is not only a representative of, you know, a brutal autocratic power in the neoliberal paradigm, but it's also inefficient, incapable, unveil the power that should be kept at minimum. And this understanding has led to an enormous trust in civil society as a panacea for inefficient and undemocratic governance. And the rest is pretty much history. The European Union, World Bank and UN 
um, followed one size fits all approaches and pushed for civil society support programs and they donated um, millions of dollars and euros all around the world for the creation of professionalized, mostly NGO sector. Um, and this process has created what is called as the NGOization of civil society in developing and middle income countries in uh, less democratic countries. And this highly professionalized NGO sector her, has turned out to be, at the end, quite devoid of grassroots connections and more accountable to donors due to their financial dependence. Um, and for, uh, uh, for liberal and democratic oriented donors, civil society has become uh, not a means to an end, but an end in itself. And uh, uh, what, was, what turned out to be is, is uh, was an oversupply of NGOs uh, that created competition for funds as the major goal for survival instead of rights-based activism. Um, and this has led to uh, civil society's marketization or depolitization with driven by project management and bureaucracy. Mm. Um, this picture, of course, the reality has become quite uh, contradicting with the idea of civil society as the practitioner, as, as the venue for practitioner citizens, as an access point to democracy with its you know, rights-based participatory and pluralistic qualities. And here, we see a connection to the rise of a critical school of thought towards civil society, the second major approach that I mentioned. So the enjoyization and the new liberalization of civil society has been criticized mainly by feminist, neo-Gramscian, neo-Marxist, critical race, um, even anti-colonialism scholars. And this critical reflection um, challenges the assumed autonomy and self-regulating capacity of civil society. Rather, it sees civil society as a realm of contestation over hegemony, or more accurately, um, where hegemony in the Gramscian sense, that consentful acceptance of power is constructed and challenged at the same time. So the Gramscian approach acknowledges civil society um, uh, to, to operate potentially in a counter hegemonic fashion in opposition to a potentially totalitarian civil society, a civil uh, uh, totalitarian state. But of course, civil society in this critical school of thought cannot be neutral or totally independent of the state. Even in democratic contexts, the state intervenes and regulates the civil society realm. Civil society and the state interact within a network of material, organizational, personal, legal connections. And in this approach, civil society is also accepted as a realm of inequality, whereby uh, class, ethnic, and religious structures are reflected and perpetuated, uh, and, and particularly affect uh, citizens' ability to mobilize in civil society. Because in any given society, all individuals or groups cannot have an equal access of being heard or having an impact uh, by organizing through civil society. So this critical argument goes on saying that civil society actually mirrors the wider sociopolitical atmosphere. This is why um, in the Gramscian scholarship, critical scholarship, the relationship between civil society and democracy is not necessarily positive or known. We cannot take it for granted, but uh, this relationship between civil society and democracy should be checked and verified in each case. Um, so critical approach to civil society actually has provided crucial insights for us to understand civil society in undemocratic states. Um, donor aid and insistence on civil society promotion, as I said, has created an NGO sector that is quite depoliticized. And actually, authoritarian rulers learned quickly how to appropriate this neoliberalized and depoliticized civil society model for their own resilience. Instead of crushing civil society, authoritarian regimes today allow associational life to flourish and even promote organizations as long as they act, these organizations act within the limits set by political authorities. 
In this respect, we can say that many authoritarian regimes have repoliticized civil society through co-optation of existing organizations. Another strategy of appropriating and capturing civil society in undemocratic context is um, the ordering of or, or cultivating um, what is called a government-oriented civil society organizations or those gongos. So gongos, government-oriented organizations have some autonomy in terms of membership uh, and activities, but they remain highly dependent on the authoritarian governments for funding and operations. So it's a clientelist relationship. The civil society manages and controls dissent by channeling grievances into acceptable forms of complaint. Therefore, they redefine the nature of civil society by promoting acceptable forms of claims making. Uh, and gongos also provide a democratic disguise that authoritarian regimes desperately need as a facade of democratization you know, to, to continue to exist. So we can argue that interest groups, civil society in autocratic contexts, uh, they do not have resources to maintain organizational survival if they challenge the regime. So they can only survive through close collaboration with the incumbents. So they, they, they therefore seek to, seek to maximize their gains and adapt to the regime's rules. This is one reason for cooptation. The second reason for cooptation is that, uh, that the top level, top management of such organizations often grow a vested interest in the continuation of the corrupt regime corrupt autocratic regimes, and they align with the goals of the regime. And third, uh, resisting uh, co-optation would mean institutional death for inst interest groups, uh, because authoritarian incumbents usually repress voices that are able to produce really counter hegemonic discourses to the regime. So those who could resist co-optation, there might be some resistance, well, they would end up mobilizing without masses, without large scale contention, uh, and then they, they would be optimized. So the overall co-opted nature of civil society, actually in autocratic regimes, has really led some authors within the critical tradition to depict a really static, very dark picture of civil society. Um, and then they, they, they even argued that civil society can hardly develop in undemocratic contexts. But where we are uh, in terms of civil society within the context of democratic regression and autocratization, uh, are we really helpless? So let's summarize here. What we know so far about civil society is first uh, from the liberal scholarship that focuses on democratic transition that is when autocratic countries democratize, they claim that civil society is naturally democratic. It, had, it would help transition eventually, ensuring a steady continuation of democratic uh, transition, democratic path. Or we have uh, the critical scholarship that engages with structural factors deeply and rightly, by highlighting inequalities between social groups and power dynamics with the state, between civil society and state, and autocratic state with repression capacity. Yet, of course, this comes um, at the expense of the agency. They offer an extremely static view where agency has really no means of empowerment and innovation. And these accounts, uh, on long-term consolidated autocracies should be really evaluated carefully, especially when applied to the cases of democratic erosion, autocratization, like the case of Turkey. And it is exactly what we are going to turn our attention in the next part of this seminar. Uh, we will look into the scope conditions, the discrete ways in which civil society transforms and acts under democratic backsliding in former democracies. I hope to see you in the next part of the seminar. Thank you.